Southern Florida's Everglades, with its virgin forests, cypress swamps, and rivers of grass provided food, shelter, and medicines, and protection for the remnants of several southeastern native tribes and escaped slaves. Fleeing for their lives from the federal government, they were driven deep into the Everglades. It was their life experience of the connection between Mother Earth and her trees, plants, animals, fish, and water. This natural harmony is what informed and sustained their efforts to survive. Refugees from their own land, they eventually became recognized by the federal government and known as the Seminole Indian Nation. During the 1900s, Seminoles witnessed the systematic draining of Everglade waterways. The consequences changed the land dramatically, disrupting the harmony of the Everglade ecosystem. Loss of habitat threatened many of their traditional ways, especially the collection of plant and tree bark for traditional medicines. It's always been the way of life for the Seminole people. We were supposed to use the trees and the plants to heal ourselves and use it for whatever we needed to to survive. It's always been important and always will be important to, um, to our tribe. It should never be forgotten that we should try to carry it on and, and use it for healing purposes and whatever else we need to use it for. I'm Jeanette Cypress and I'm here with my grandmother Susie Billy and my mother Agnes Cypress and we're out here in, in the woods. We usually come out here and collect plants. This is um, like our pharmacy. We come out here to collect different plants for different medicines that we prepare. Uh, my mother and I are, are learning um, medicine for my grandmother. She's a tr traditional healer and she's been practicing for a long time. She started learning when she was about 12 from her family. We're from the Panther clan and they're considered the medicine people and we're trying to keep the tradition alive and a lot of young people um, have lost some of it and we're hoping that if we learn we can teach a lot of our young people and keep the medicine going. And one of the things that we focus on is uh, a medicine for women. It's for like postpartum or if a person is having problems with menstruation or a woman's having uh, like pelvic problems or hip problems if someone falls and break a hip um, it it's for all that and it it involves a lot of um, tree barks we're collecting um, the tree bark from um, a pine tree and this is one of the the barks that go in for um, the women's medicine that i had talked about earlier we usually just um, peel the top part off it's pretty easy to peel off and we cut the piece of the inside and they say that the reason why you use a pine tree is because you see the sap, it's sticky, and they believe that it makes things heal, things sticking together to heal back. Like if a person has a baby and let's say they had a, I think it's called episiotomy, then maybe it helps heal that back up. They use it like in a steam. This is a maple tree. Um, it's one of the trees we use for the women's medicine, and you can see where we've, been here probably for the last couple of years we use this tree quite a bit it heals back over and then we'll come and peel some more but there's quite a few maple trees out here but this is one of the ones we've used quite often this is a willow tree we use the bark of this for um, the women's medicine I talked about earlier plus we use this tree for a lot of other purposes med medicine purposes and um, it grows usually in the water or a lot of times at the edge of the water where it's wet this is the saw palmetto, and we use the, the stretchy brown fiber material to make um, Seminole dolls out of. We also used to eat, it has like a small little cabbage inside. We used to eat those, and then we also eat the berries from them. We try to build our buildings like more in certain areas. We try to map out where our homes are gonna go. And we're pretty good about checking out the wetlands, making sure you know somebody's not putting a home where they shouldn't. We try not to destroy a lot of the, the environment. We try to preserve things. If, if there's a certain place that a lot of plants grow, like medicine plants, we try not to clean that out. We try to leave it natural so that we can go back and get the plants. So 
I don't know, I feel pretty confident that the tribe will always work towards that. Cypress swamps and hardwood hammocks provide the tribe with native trees for different uses. Hammocks are teardrop-shaped natural rises of land in the midst of a swamp that grows dense stands of hardwood trees used for carving canoes. Canoes played a central role in the life of Seminole people. Entire families made journeys through the waterways for supplies. Trees large enough to carve the early canoes are now rare finds. The few canoe carvers left, like Henry Billy, have begun passing on the tradition of canoe building so that others will be reminded of the central role trees played in the lives of Seminole people and help develop the appreciation of carving skills necessary in traditional canoe building. Where I come from, it's only canoe, the transportation. We don't have a highways and all that, so only canoe that we use it every day. And then, uh, so important for, uh, for us to use it, the canoe. So we have to take care of it. No highways, no sidewalk, no playground, just a uh, saltwater swamp. Like 65 years later, and I was thinking I'll start making on those big canoes, the one we used to use it. Trying to find a uh, bigger trees, but can't find it no more. So, like 50 years ago, so we don't have enough big trees. So, we only this size today. I learned from my dad watching making and when I was a kid I used to sell souvenirs and that's how they trade by groceries that's how I learned when I was a kid oh this one here made out of pop hats uh, Better than the cypress because cypress sometimes you can make a spoon out of the cypress, but uh, they cracks easy sometimes. And pop has stronger woods, and it lasts longer. It don't crack as much. And so they use the softest spoons a lot and stir the softy and even the hot water stands and won't crack even it dries. It's good woods. I go to a big uh, reservation over north of here, Brightening Reservation. You don't have any cypress. You got to save a palm tree up there. <laughs> I don't think I can stay it because I can't stand it. Open country. I like woods and I like water. And um, I imagine not only just me, just like a lot of people who are like living in the woods all the time. They can't live in the cities. They get bored. Too many travelers, too many people. Out here, it's nice and quiet. The ones on wild airplanes flow, flow over. But in any other times, you can hear birds when you get up in the morning. So. Seminole children learn their traditional ways from tribal elders. The interaction enriches their developing minds and gives the children a sense of pride in their culture. Just as a large tree provides shelter and protection to small saplings until their root system is established, Developing the children's understanding of traditional ways strengthens their cultural roots, enabling them to become a healthy, resilient people. In the past, basket weaving from grasses grown and collected near large pine stands provide financial support for many indigenous families. 
As forest borders shrink, songs of woodland birds grow silent and ecosystems die. The resources necessary for traditional seminal practices are vanishing. This way of life is dependent upon good forest and land use management and the preservation of contiguous forested lands. You know, when somebody burns woods, like in the pines, they're burning the grass. And uh, then you have to wait a long time for the grass to grow. And it's, you know, that, that's another problem that we have. And then um, another thing that I see is that, you know, there's a lot of farming in the Monkley, and they come in and, and clearing all the land. Where we used to pull grass, you know, they're clearing out all that pine areas. That's taking away our grass because, you know, we can't go out there and pull grass anymore because they cleared it. The little section that we go to, it's on the reservation, so, you know, we don't have no problems there. The bottoms that we use is made out of palmetto fibers, and to give it uh, the stability is uh, a little cardboard in the middle. You put um, the palmetto fibers on both sides and then you sew it together and then you sew it onto the, the first round is um, sewing onto the bottom. When I do the lids, um, I put the doll heads on there and they're made out of um, palmetto fibers. So when I to finish the lids, because these will have lids and uh, when I finish the lids, I, I put the little doll head on there like this to give it a little handle. And then I put beads around the neck. And this is how it will sit when I finish the lid. The trees mean a lot to me because when I go out, out there in the pines to pull the grass, because um, they usually grow, grow around the pines. and. Uh, it gives me a shade and then it gives me a, a place to um, sit down and rest. And then when you're out there in the woods, you know, it's quiet and peaceful. And uh, when the wind's blowing, you can hear the, you know, the trees. We came from family of Millicent people. My great uncles was a Millicent man, and my aunts and uncles was Millicent people, and they liked doctors in the Indian way. And my mother was one of the ladies that, uh, that they respect as a Millicent lady. And she went and delivered a lot of babies. I used to go with her when I started getting to being 10 and 11, 12. And my mother used to go out and get, uh, when some, we have cold, she goes out and get the bark of a weeping willow down at the bottom where it's wet and the roots like, you know, and then bring it back and wash it and, and boil it so the tea like, you know, and then that's what she give you for, for bad cold if you have bad cold and coughing. I don't believe in cutting the trees, every tree's around the house and they should leave some of the trees because, like my great uncle said, said the trees take the dust and away from you so you won't get sickness from the air that carries the germs. It's, he, told, he used to tell us that. That's why we live out in, a, in the middle of a hammock, you know, where a lot of uh, palm trees and cabbage palm trees and oak trees all around. And so today I said I could advise a lot of people that if you have trees, you're lucky. In 1957, Seminole Tribe become organized tribe under the Council of Oak in Hollywood, Florida. One day I walked beneath the Council Oak or Council Tree. I thought to myself, if he could talk, what would he say to me? Would he tell me how once he shaded and provided for the inhabitants of this land? and how through history all things were changed by man. I know he would speak of the Seminoles early day when beneath his branches the children would play. Then came a time when decisions had to be met and within his shade the meeting tables were set. Some of the faces, the oak said, were never honest and true. 
They only thought of themselves as the chosen few. Yet many were there who were true in what they said, and these were the ones that ultimately led. The oak went on as if to say that in those times the people were happy in their way. The oak remembered distinctly those men and women of the past. Because of them, this nation is where it is at last. The heated arguments, the finances at an all-time low, but together the oak and Seminole would eventually grow. And within the Seminole homes, there may have been no door, but the oak proudly said that you could never tell these people they were poor. And as the old oak went on to say, I want to tell you something this day. There's a comparison here I want you to see of how the Seminoles are like this mighty oak tree. You see, together as a seed, we both once grew, but not all went on, just a dismal few. Some nations and trees have fallen in their attempt to grow, perhaps defeated, trodden, and weakened too slow. But on in years we have faced the storm and rain, stood above the flood as in stature we'd gain. Our weak branches would soon falter and fall to the ground, but the roots of our faith would soon abound. And the leaves of life would fade from the blister of death from the winter sting, only to be replaced with another life in the spring. And above all, we knew from the tip of our head to the roots below the sod that we were together created through the grace of a living God. And with this, the old oak gave a joyous sigh, for I knew he represented a way of life that would never die. We thought, oh, we hunted them, yeah. Well, the, the poem that I wrote on the Council Oak uh, was inspired by the Council Oak that we've had over there on the Hollywood Reservation. And as a young boy, I, uh, I remember going under the Council Oak. I remember watching some of the meetings taking place under the Council Oak. That's where basically most of all of our uh, uh, tribal government was conducted was under that council oak and I remember a couple of old tables that they had there and some of the elders there would sit around that and they would talk a lot of the tribe's uh, problems and situations that were coming up and uh, I guess that's kind of what inspired me to to write the poem about the council oak and I thought about some of the things maybe uh, that the council oak was able to witness even before the times of the meetings the things because it's in a very old tree and it kind of stands out in an open field. And and uh, as a young boy, I remember playing games under there, and I remember a lot of us used to get together and play a lot of games. And Not only were the meetings conducted, but as I was thinking about the Council Oak, I began to think about some of the things that maybe the Council Oak was able to witness. And there was a sense of a, a spiritual uh, awareness, I think, that the Council Oak had something maybe to tell us. You know, to me, a, a tree has always been a, it's in part of our legends. It's a, it's a part of, you know, the, the natural resource that we've been a part of, you know, for years and centuries. And uh, there's always something about the tree that has always been, uh, it's a, a spiritual attraction that I've always had for trees. And I, I, I love trees and especially, you know, some of the major trees that we have, you know, like our oaks and our cypress trees. And, and uh, I had my, my, uh, like, you know, you see the chickies, you know, built out of the cypress. The tree has always been a part of our culture, and it's always given to us as far as, you know, a place for home or shelter. Uh, there was just a lot of things, you know, we hunted out of the trees. There's been a lot of, you know, birds that we've lived off, a lot of the different birds that we've had. And, and then the tree has shaded us. And then just like this area here, when hurricanes come, we had to go to higher ground. And a lot of times I remember my mother telling me stories that some of the younger people, they would tie them, actually tie them to some of the bigger trees so, you know, they wouldn't get washed away in a, in a flood or in a big wind or something like that. I think we're going to get to that point, you know, we're just going to take everything away and there's nothing going to be left. And I think to our young people here, even among our, our reservation, is that uh, I had an opportunity to see some of the things that was here in this area that was a part of our past and a lot of those young people will never get to see that. It's gone. And especially there on the Hollywood Reservation, where they're they're right in the urban area of uh, of uh, Miami and Hollywood, they'll never get to experience some of the things that I did in growing up. They'll never get to go out and and uh, 
maybe do hunting under the trees. They won't ever get out and see some of the, be a part of the shade of some of those trees. They won't understand some of the trees, how they, how it just through the, through uh, God, the Great Spirit put a tree head together and how it grew. And it was in all in his plan of why it was there and why it isn't there. And today we've, uh, you know, we've destroyed a lot of that. The water is beginning to go down, and that's one of the things that the cypress tree thrives on. So when you start going and irrigating, taking all out of your water, pretty soon, you know, some of these old cypress that like in an area like this, you know, aren't going to thrive like they used to. And pretty soon that water goes down, and that's one of the things that's got to keep up a cypress tree. And uh, the oaks, you know, I look at an oak and I think, wow, the years that it took to do that, and then all of a sudden we just come with a bulldozer and we just run over that, that oak, and that thing has so many years of, of existence there that's been there long before we were, and then all of a sudden, you know, for us to come in there with no, really no concept of what, what we're, what's happening right there. Money, you know, through greed, through different things that, uh, see a, a building, a construction, constructing, and this is one of the things I like to get, is just because we construct a building of some sort, that doesn't mean that it's progress. It doesn't always mean it's progress. So uh, we can remember that. Seminoles have an appreciation for the interdependence between themselves and the trees. Even though they are no longer dependent on trees for some of their basic necessities, Seminoles like the Lakota and other tribal people continue to honor and respect the bond we have with our Mother Earth. The sawtooth palmetto was a lot of our supplies for things that we needed to use for home. And so um, we um, ate the berries of the sawtooth palmetto. And when we cut the tree down, uh, we didn't just leave, you know, just took apart and left it. You used everything. And the, um, the hearts were eaten as food. We use the, um, the fibers that come on it for uh, making different things. And um, uh, sometimes it was used for kindling, you know, just shred it up. And, and if you can find a way to store it, you had a really nice kindling that would just light. When you, if you have a flint stone, you know, you just could light that. Or if you rub two sticks together, you could light with this and it was real easy to start a fire that way. The palms grow on the, in, in the high areas where the oak trees grow, you know, the sable palms, and these hardwood hammocks provided a different sort of ecosystem that provided acorns, um, um, you know, like the oak bark for uh, astringent purposes. They boiled it for making washes for sores and things like that. Here in Florida, if you didn't live on a, a real high place, you got flooded, you know, like during the hurricanes and stuff, because water just uh, simply ran over the state of Florida from Okeechobee on out. Water would stand like uh, seven, six or seven months out of the year. The water would be, you know, from at least four feet, five feet, you know. And it would stand like that for months at a time as it went down slowly. But you know something? It washed everything out. Once the flood, you know, happened, the mosquitoes and things like that, the larvae, you know, they got washed out to the ocean. And, and you didn't have as much. You could sleep out in the open just on, um, the palmetto fans that they put on the ground and you had a sheet to put it down as a pallet and you wore a sheet for the top uh, for a blanket and you slept comfortable. There was no bugs to bother you. But when the canals went through, that was when waters, you know, were standing too stagnant in ponds and stuff for too long and mosquitoes got really, really bad. Uh, I remember, you know, sleeping like that without a mosquito bar or a mosquito net or anything. If there was some way to see what I see, the open spaces, the trees, the beautiful scenery, 
beautiful sunsets, you know, and sunrises and and birds, you know, and Spanish moss just fluttering in the breeze and stuff like that. I think people just need this sort of thing for spiritual purposes, you know, because uh, when I'm in the woods, it's like being in a cathedral to me, like being in a church. And that's where I feel closest to the one above. And, and I'm a part of this, you know, this nature. And it calls me. I have to get out there and do just, we just get in our truck and head out for the woods sometimes, my husband and I, just to go look around in the woods for no other purpose but just to look around. The healing powers of trees to clean the air and nurture our spirits has implications for all people, native and non-native alike. We have an opportunity to learn from the Seminoles the practice of healing and restoring our natural harmony in our forests and in our lives. Thank you. 